Hi, welcome to the Israel First television program from our studios in Jerusalem. Great to have you with us. Thank you so much for joining us today. You know, one of the things that's very interesting is when you pick up the newspaper, and I just happen to have a copy of the Times newspaper from England, and you look at the stories in it, you wonder, are they truthful? Are they accurate? And in the studio today, we have a very special guest, Tamar Sterntal from the organization Camera. Thank you so much for coming in today. Great to have you with us. Great, it's great, great to be here. Appreciate you giving us your time uh, to talk to us. Uh, Tamar Sterntal is the director of the Campaign for Accuracy in Middle East Reportings Israel office, which she opened in 1994. Tamar has worked for Camera, that's the abbreviated version of the organization since 1999, and regularly communicates with major media outlets, getting corrections in print and and on air. Tamar first came across the media bias while she was at McGill University and we'll be talking about that with you today. And she's in the studio today to talk to us about the issues in the newspaper. And um, just to get us going, you know, funny enough, Tamar, I've just picked up this newspaper, The Times. This is uh, The Times newspaper from England. It's from Saturday. The coverage, this is the coverage of Israel. We turn the page and uh, we get that as the uh, coverage of Israel, a picture of uh, people rush smoke and people rushing. So we're really going to be going into this, a serious issue for many of you. Many of you are supporters of Israel and uh, advocates for Israel. And we're going to be talking about um, how you can get involved, how you can change things. Now, as I say, thank you so much for coming in. My pleasure. Uh, how did you get involved in journalism? Were you interested at school or was it something you suddenly decided you'd like to be involved in? Uh, journalism has been a passion of mine for a long time. When I was in high school, I was um, an editor of the high school paper and I continued at university, as you mentioned, at McGill University. I had a connection there with an editor who was writing for the alternative, very left-wing newspaper. I had been interning as a high school student at the Jewish Exponent, that's the Jewish newspaper in Philadelphia. So I naturally went to that media outlet. And right away I encountered an intense bias against Israel at that newspaper. So this was in Canada? Yes, this was in Montreal. And, and you found bias in the national Canadian newspapers or television? Um, yes, I didn't uh, study it. I wasn't yet working at the organization so I didn't study it in a very focused way, but my personal experience working as a journalist at the campus newspaper was that there was a tremendous bias against Israel, running op-eds, uh, charging that Israel had not bit, built any new roads or universities in the West Bank uh, for Palestinians since 1967. That was all false. Yet on the other hand, when I came forward to the editors and said, I'd like to cover Jewish students protesting outside the Iranian embassy in Ottawa against their support for terrorism. They refused to let me run the story, uh, saying, well, prove to us, show us that the Iranians are backing terrorism. So I brought them all kinds of sources, and they said, sorry, too late, the time has passed. So, uh, and this was a newspaper which had once done a whole a whole issue dedicated to racism, um, and the only thing that they had addressing anti-Semitism was that uh, Zionism is racism. Uh, it, it, going back to the UN resolution, which had already been repealed, but they were bemoaning the fact that the UN resolution that Zionism is racism had been repealed. So this was a very hostile uh, environment, which did not adhere to, obviously, professional codes of journalistic ethics. And that this is what really put me on the path uh, professionally where, where I ended up where I am today. And you'll, you'll be thinking uh, today, well, you know, I can see bias in the media and it's something maybe you've actually got involved in. Maybe you've written to newspapers or television stations. But how did camera start? Um, CAMERA's Committee for Accuracy in Middle East Reporting in America, founded over 35 years ago, so we're the oldest and largest organization uh, dealing with these kinds of issues. I believe we've prompted more media corrections on any topic, leave aside Israel on any topic, than any other individual or organization in the world. We were founded in 1982 during the first Lebanon War because of the uh, terribly biased coverage of the war that we were seeing um, at that time. Specifically, there was a photograph of a baby um, in a hospital in Lebanon with his arms, uh, according to the caption, which was United Press International, that his arms had uh, been burnt off and he was being held by a nurse, and the charge was that an Israeli attack was the cause for this horrible injury. And this photograph was splashed all over the front pages of 
many national newspapers, was in the news programs, uh, broadcasts, and was a copy of it was sitting on the desk of President Ronald Reagan. And it was this photograph which was said to inform his policy on how to deal with this conflict. And he sent in American troops into Lebanon, thereby saving the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Organization, terrorist mm -hmm. organization groups from the, from the IDF. But there's just one problem with this photograph, which so moved the president and influenced his foreign policy. Um, Israeli doctors who saw it immediately understood that a child who the day before had lost two arms could not be held in this position that he was shown to be in, drinking from a bottle like a normal healthy child. They went to Lebanon, they tracked down the child and found that his injuries, he had injured an arm, but he didn't lose them, thankfully, were not nearly as severe as portrayed, and that in fact he had not been injured in an Israeli attack, but by an errant PLO shell. Um, so, the, so it wasn't even Israel, was it? No, even. Israel was not responsible. Right. And in the course of decades of, of work the cameras carried out, since that time we see repeat, um, you know, deaths blamed on Israel that after the fact are shown to be, in fact, that Israel was not responsible. In some cases it was an errant uh, Hamas rocket coming from Gaza um, and, and the like. So this, yeah. this story repeats itself over it's, and over. It's quite interesting because, you know, we, we started, when we started the program, it was really I mean, that was really one of the reasons, because there was so much wrong stories in the press, there were so many inaccuracies in the press in the United Kingdom, and that's how we started doing uh, the television program, was one of the reasons we started was because of this. You came across uh, from the United States to live in Israel and start the camera office. Was that very different from the work you, or you still very involved I with? I carried over much of my original responsibilities. Each camera researcher uh, follows on a regular basis certain media outlets. And by the way, we cover uh, national media outlets on an ongoing basis, but we also often receive from our, we have over 65,000 members, and they send us tips about things they might see in smaller local papers. And sometimes they know that something's wrong, and sometimes they don't have the information Information. And so where there's a resource to check into the facts, to provide them with documentation to follow up directly with editors, or we, we can do that ourselves. If you're watching today and you say, well, Martin, I need to do something. I'm in the United States. I'm seeing a local, maybe it's a local newspaper or even a national newspaper that you read regularly and you're concerned about it. Can they get in touch with you is the way through the website? Absolutely. There's a feedback form of the website where they can send a tip to us. And, and uh, one of the researchers looks at, we look at everything that's sent to us. We have a lot of uh, staff who have been with us for a long time and that have a lot of expertise. And, and we've had to you know, migrate, not only to look at the print edition, but also to be uh, very attentive to what's going on online on the Twitter feed. So we spent, we have to spend time there as well. There's no way around it. Now, Tamar, you were recently in the, I say recently, it was a little while ago, uh, you were at the Knesset, the Israeli government, that's the uh, Israeli parliament. You were there. Were you summoned by them? or And that was to talk about the uh, issues with um, accuracy in the media. Right. I received an invitation to come. It's been, uh, I guess, going back two years, 2015, I suppose. Um, it was in the context of what we call the knifing intifada. Uh, the previous fall, a spate of Palestinian violence involving mostly stabbings, but also shootings broke um, out. I'm just going to explain that uh, you're watching, you think, what's a knife in father? That was really a time of terrorism in Israel. I remember it very well. It's not that long ago. And indeed, it's still happening from time to time was when Arab terrorists, for me, it was really in Jerusalem, were attacking people uh, randomly, really, because I remember there wasn't just Jewish people that were attacking all sorts of people. Even Arab people, uh, Palestinians, were getting knifed. And they were, they were mistaken for Jews, yes. Right. And there was one by the market, I particularly remember, by the Jerusalem market where somebody was standing out, an Arab a Palestinian was standing outside and he was stabbed by a pa Palestinian. An older man, I believe it right, was. Yes, right. Yeah. So this was really a, a period of time uh, where there was uh, terrorism and you were afraid. Some people were carrying pepper sprays with yeah. them. There was people with walking sticks on the bus because it was really a time of fear. So. Yeah, it was, it was uh, largely in Jerusalem, but not only. It was also occurring in other places outside of Jerusalem within Israel. Um, and it was a very scary time, as you said. And what we saw in terms of the media coverage was oftentimes after there was an attack carried out by a Palestinian terrorist, uh, usually against an Israeli civilian, sometimes soldier, uh, then the, the terrorist would be shot, uh, neutralized by the Israeli forces or a bystander. And what was the headline, do you think, in the, 
in the major leading news outlets, things like two Palestinians shot dead in Jerusalem attack. In other words, the perpetrator became the victim. Uh, and the headlines completely obscured the fact that it was the Palestinians who had been shot who were the assailants who were attacking innocent victims. So, so it was flipping the right. events on their head. And this was what so upset. I mean, this is the kind of thing that we've been following for years, but it right. became on the radar of the Israeli leadership. And there was a special uh, session called in the uh, Foreign Affairs and, and Defense Committee. And uh, that, that's what I addressed, bringing examples of the kinds of headlines that we were seeing. So did you have other uh, journalists there or the people from the media were they there? There was a representative uh, from the Foreign Press Association who was also the um, bureau chief for Reuters at the time. His name was Luke Baker and he said afterwards in a tweet that uh, the camera and all the Israeli officials who were there were only able to bring one or two examples. So I sent him a list of dozens of examples by email and then he responded in a most unprofessional manner, not dealing with the issues at all and making a personal ad hominem attacks against me, against the leadership of the organization, which were completely off topic and just changing the subject away from the substance of the issues. And it's a complete violation of the, of the journal journalistic code that Reuters requires of its employees. Um, and then after that, we sent a letter to the top executive at Reuters about the way that Bakers was conducting himself in response to our serious substantiation. After that, he, he backed off and he started to respond more substantively. And we did see an improvement in the communication and also in the kind of way that he followed up in terms of accountability. And I should add as a postscript to this whole story that the quality of the headlines did greatly improve after sustained campaign exposing them, uh, response from, from camera and our concerned members and media outlets did get the message and they did improve on that score. Although I have to say it's not completely eradicated. I just noticed uh, Sky News Arabic, unfortunately, and, and, and we did just open an Arabic department specifically to monitor or Western media outlets who have Arabic platforms. So that's like Sky News, BBC, CNN. Uh, we were looking at the Huffington Post, which just closed its Arabic site and rolled it over into something called Arabic Post. But these are all Western media outlets. Now, uh, you're watching today and you think um, we've got Tamar Sterntan in the studio from Camera, the uh, organization that looks at accuracy and truth in the press. Uh, you know, the, you'll be watching today and you think, well, how can I make a difference? Or can I make a difference? Does it really count that people you're at home and they are watching and concerned about you've watched news from Israel which is inaccurate or not truthful and they know that. Can they make a difference? Absolutely. I mean, the f first most important step is to become an informed news consumer. And the way to do that is to follow the news, to read many different news outlets, and then you begin to notice discrepancies and you become smarter, you become more informed. And then that's when you're in a position to be able to respond to news outlets. Uh, if you don't know, the, first of all, I recommend also that you follow www.camera.org because you'll get updates on what is the media getting wrong. Wrong, and that you might see an example from one media outlet which say, oh, I saw that in my local media as well. So you know that, that here's a point for you to enter and take apart. You can respond directly to that media outlet, whether it's writing a letter to the foreign editor. Uh, sometimes you can find addresses for these people. If you need help with these things, you can definitely, uh, through our feedback form at www.camera.org, get in touch with us and we can take it up a level by we, our staff will communicate directly with that media outlet depending on the situation or we can help you find the appropriate address, we can publish about it. We believe that sunshine is the best disinfectant. Oftentimes our communication is quiet behind the scenes and that can be effective. But if not, we find that publicizing something on one of our websites, and I mentioned camera, but we have other brands covering other media outside of America. We have UK Media Watch, that's a blog that belongs to camera that follows mainstream British coverage, everything except for BBC, because BBC is such a gargantuan institution. It's a huge media outlet with all kinds of platforms, radio, television, and digital, that it's a world onto itself. So we also founded BBC Watch. That's also a project of camera. And you're watching today and you think, I'd like to get involved. There's things I'd like to do. Maybe you want to uh, be involved in advocacy for Israel, and this is something they can really get their teeth into. You know, one of the interesting things is, you know, I just picked up the, uh, this is uh, the NUJ Code of Conduct, and one of the, you know, I picked up a couple of things, and it says, 
uh, in the NUJ Code of Conduct about how a journalist is meant to report. The journalist must strive to ensure the information is honestly conveyed, accurate and fair, does his utmost to correct harmful inaccuracies and differentiates between fact and opinion. And one of the issues, the big issue I guess that you're dealing with is that the the stories that are covered about Israel are inaccurate, there's inaccuracies and you're constantly having to to rectify that. It's just very strange that of um, all the countries in the world that it's Israel that seems to get the inaccuracies about it. I mean, maybe you're watching from another country and you've got examples in your country, but it seems funny that it's Israel that seems to get so many inaccuracies about the, about the stories. That you're talking about the Israeli, the Israeli media, or you're talking about international the coverage, coverage of coverage of Israel from both in, both in Israel and outside Israel. Well, I think Israel probably gets more intensive coverage per capita than any other country, even than any other conflict in the world. And if you look at staffing, the number of journalists who are are, are stationed in Israel on an ongoing basis, and that's even before you deal with a, an acute conflict when hundreds more are are brought in on a you know on a short term basis to deal with the conflict and they're brought in without any prior experience or knowledge of the area necessarily, many of them, and they, they work as a herd and they rely on each other and they, they are all quoting and copy and pasting from each other. So there's little original reporting outside the box and there's a tendency to follow a certain narrative. Um, do, you, do you think that the media, because I know a lot of you will be reading the English media in, um, in Israel, which is basically the Jerusalem Post and Haaretz. I know, I know there's a few other, there are other people like uh, Israel National News and people like that. But do you think that the media in Israel is fair? So if, so you're, you're watching today and you're, you know, they're taking their, um, their news from Israel from Israel media, is it, do you think the actual... That's a terrific question. I think outsiders would naturally think, well, if an Israeli is reporting it, it must be true. But at camera, we notice much of the misinformation in the international press originates here locally, which is why we founded a Hebrew site called Perspectiva, which looks at the Israeli media, all the various Israeli mainstream media outlets um, and the reports that they're covering, and they apply the same kind of working criteria that we use for our, our, our effective, successful model that we've employed for over 30 years. They apply to the Israeli media. Uh, it's a little bit a, di a different market. It's a different mentality, so there's not the same notion of accountability and corrections. Little by little, we've been chipping away at that. The most influential Israeli media outlet in the foreign realm is Haaretz, uh, and that's, public, that's a daily newspaper which publishes in Hebrew and English and has a very popular English language website. Uh, interestingly, its readership in Israel among Hebrew readers is very, very small and completely disproportionate to its huge uh, English language readership. It's relied upon mostly, it's the, the, the number one resource for the foreign press focused here in Israel. Uh, either stationed here or reporting on Israel, so it's a very important resource. And if you are in Israel and you get the Haaretz newspaper, you also get the the, the New York Times right. is included. Uh, I, d I think that's every it's day. It's the international edition right. of the New York Times every day except for a is Sunday. It, do you think it's an issue of politics because, you know, there's left wing and right wing, or is it really that they are mis- that they are mis they're inaccurate well, with some of them? one thing that's important to understand about Haaretz is that the English edition is not uh, exact translation of the Hebrew edition, and that's being generous. So many times we have documented instances in which um, Palestinian aggression, violence, or other wrongdoing, which was reported in the Hebrew edition, is either downplayed or entirely omitted from the English edition, and or misinformation about Israel in a negative sense is added into the English edition. And we first started documenting this back in 2010. Um, since then, we've been successful in getting them to be responsive to some of our concerns and to correct. And I'll give you some examples because I think they are very interesting. But it's hard for us to know you know, who is responsible. The names of the translators aren't published. So we don't know who is working. I suspect there are young uh, immigrants who are very ideological, but we don't have that information to know what is exactly the mechanism of how the package of the photograph story and headline in the English edition come come to be and why are these discrepancies appearing all the time and I'll just give you some examples because they, they're really very uh, striking for instance uh, it's been a problem in the last couple of years that cancer patients in Gaza who get treatment in Israel have had a harder time receiving security clearance from the Israelis to come through to 
enter Israeli hospitals and be treated there. And the way that uh, that Haaretz reported it in English, so it reported that these patients, these really, you know, poor women who are really suffering have been refused over and over again permission to come in. Um, and twice Haaretz reported this story in space of a year, year and a half, and both times the Hebrew edition included the response from the Israeli security forces, which is that Hamas has been exploiting these vulnerable patients, the most vulnerable people in the Gaza Strip who are in need of, desperate need of medical attention, which they can't get there and they, they need to come to Israel for, um, exploiting them and manipulating them, forcing them to either smuggle in money or plans uh, to help Hamas activists with terror attacks uh, and, and bring that bring those things into Israel. Uh, this information was included in the Hebrew edition twice and twice completely left out on the English edition. And the second time, we got it corrected. The first time, they added it after we objected. You know, somebody has to be sitting and reading both editions, making these comparisons. Um, the second time had specific stories of specific patients, um, and, it, and the, the Israeli for, uh, security uh, source also gave a response about these women, saying in one case, she never applied for a permit. In another case, she applied to go to a conference, not to go for medical treatment. In another place, the claim was that she had been denied entry, and in fact, she had been allowed entry. Um, so this is very important information for the reader to get, especially the international reader, who's not as familiar with the situation here. And, and this is the kind of, of, uh, of case we see where the translation is, is distorted from, from the, in comparison to the Hebrew edition. As we uh, are just finishing, you know, one of the interesting things is we've got this narrative of the the Palestinian victim and the is you know the Israeli aggressor. Do you think that uh, uh, it's going to ever be that we can change the narrative, or is that kind of in stone now? <laughs> Wow, that's such a difficult question. I, that was one of our major criticisms of New York Times, and I think I kept referring to the New York Times because the New York Times is the, I work in the American realm, as I mentioned, the New York Times is still the most influential media outlet, not only in America, but I think around the world. It really sets the tone and pace it's a tone and, and content. It really sets the agenda for the rest of the media world that is looking um, at the New York Times. Um, and one of our major criticisms for which we ran a billboard campaign, we had a billboard outside the Times uh, building in Times Square in New York wow. uh, during the 2014 Gaza war that Israel's is under attack from Hamas and also from the New York Times. And every time the Times employees had to enter exit the building, they had to see this billboard. Um, essentially, the reader's editor agreed with us. She published a column on the coverage of the Israeli-Palestinian coverage, uh, on, the, on the quality of the coverage in, in, in her newspaper, and she agreed that too often the Palestinians are portrayed only as victims, and that it's a very one-dimensional type of coverage, um, and that they need to enhance their um, their, their, their coverage of the Palestinians as actors. They're not only victims, they're also agents in this conflict. And I think she really got to the, the crux of the matter. Uh, that's the problem that we see with the coverage. And there, there were some, um, I mean, it's still an ongoing problem at the Times, very, very much so, including the coverage of most recent events in the Gaza-Israel border. But there were some stories in there after that that tried to give a more multifaceted um, insight into the Palestinian society and problems within the society which impact the conflict and really have nothing to so do with you, Israel. If you want to know more, you're going to have to go to the website, go to, what, what's the website they can go to? www.camera.org. And uh, if you'd like further information, you can get it all from there and we look forward to seeing you next week. Shalom dear friends, today we carry on looking at the prophets. And do you remember the name? Nevi'im, yes, you're right. And we're looking at the minor prophets. There were 12, and in the Hebrew scriptures, they are all put in one section, in one book. So this first Nevi'im, this first prophets, we are looking at six today, and it was during the early Assyrian period. The first name is Hosea, in Hebrew is Hosea. And when you hear the name, it's like, oh, this means salvation. He was a man who married Gomer. She was not of a good reputation. And they get married, and they have children, and they divorce, and he goes to buy him again. And it's really a metaphor and a beautiful story to show the strong love of God for Israel and that she will return back to God. 
Okay. The second one, the second prophet is Joel, and the name in Hebrew is Yoel, Yoel. So you can hear it's like Ya and El. So it means that Yehovah is God. And it's a beautiful name. And he was living in the Galilee. So he was from the northern kingdom and he died also in the Galilee. Now, the one after was Amos in English and in Hebrew is Amos. Amos was living in Tekoa. And Tekoa is next to Bethlehem in the south of Jerusalem. So he was from Judah, but he was speaking to the northern kingdom and said to them, you have to repent. Bad things are going to happen. Return to God. Then we have Obadiah, and the name in Hebrew is Ovadiah. Ovadiah, when you hear Oved, it means servant. So he was a servant of God. Then we have Jonah, and Jonah, the name in Hebrew is Yonah. And Yonah is a dove, and he was the prophet who was speaking to Nineveh. And Nineveh, the big city of Assyria, repented, and they returned to God. Then we have the last one of the six one that we are looking of the prophet is Micah. And Micah in Hebrew is quite different, is Micha. And Micha means you can hear, oh, who is like God? And this was his beautiful name. So we look again at the name just in Hebrew because we start to be very good is Oshea, then Yoel, then we have Amos, then we have Ovadia. Then we have Yona, and the last one is Micha. We've done very well again together, and we'll see you next week. Bye. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Very, very interesting about the bias in the press and what you can do to make a difference. We love to hear from you. Don't forget, you can email us at info at israelfirst.org. Visit the website, a lot of information there, www.israelfirst.org. And remember, we're the program that looks at the land, the people, and the language. Mm -hmm.